my name is Genesis and we want to welcome you to Free Life Chapel. Here at FLC, we want to help you discover and live the free life in Christ. Listen, we are so excited you decided to tune in with us today, but if you're ever in the Central Florida area, come check us out. We are all about family and we would love to connect with you face to face. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of our FLC family, check us out at freelifechapel.org. We can't wait to connect with you. Until then, check out this message that's in store just for you. We're in a series called Bussin. Some of y'all don't have a clue what that is, and it took me a minute to. Bussin, you're talking about this, this that, like living that next level life. That bougie thing, like, oh, you bussin', that outfit is bussin', all that, right? It's, it, it, it's, that, it's that, extra, that extra bump, that thing, you got it on your life. We want you to have a bussin' 24 is what we're trying to tell you. We want you to dial it up. Anybody want more in 24 than you had in 23? If you didn't raise your hand, I'm taking yours and mine both. I'm going to ask you one more time. Anybody want more in 24 than you had in 20? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Week number one, we hit this series. We talked about you got to participate with God in order to receive the blessing. You got to live that turned up life. I mean, we had an illustration where you got to, the cup, you got to, might have it upside down and the blessings are not filling your life. You got to turn the cup up. You got to participate with God. You got to listen to the podcast. Week number two, we talked about the difference between faith and trust. Faith gets you blessed, trust gets you blessed. Faith gets you saved, trust gets you blessed. Faith gets you saved. There's a lot of folks that have enough faith to know God, but they don't have enough trust to live blessed. And that trusting life is what the word speaks to. There's consequences for the decisions we make. And that's not to scare us, that's good news. Because when you know what the outcomes, the results are, if I do this, then God's going to do that. That becomes a blessing. This entire book, this book is a book of promises. And those promises are outcomes that you can expect when we begin to honor and serve God with our lives. And then today, I just want to talk to you basically about this. We're just going to live all in. I'm not leaving anything on the table. It's like when you're playing that final game of your senior year and it's that Friday night and it's on like, just leave it all on the field, man. Just go hard. Just go crazy. Just give it everything you've got. Don't hold anything back. And this is where we put faith and trust into action. You got to do something with it. Last night we were flying back from Cincinnati. They delayed our flight a couple of times, began to wonder if we were going to be able to make it back. Liz had no faith. I was full of faith. I knew it was going to be fine. But we, we were, we, we, we were uh, sitting on the plane. It's amazing how it takes four adults to take care of two kids under two. Four adults, two kids under two. We're passing kids back and forth and spilling stuff and, and eating crackers and all kinds of things, you know, that kind of thing. He dropped his pass. He lick it off. It's fine. Like, oh, just, 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 just all that kind of thing. going. And um, we're sitting on the plane, and all of a sudden, here comes this dude on the plane. It's like a mountain stepped on the plane. And he's boom, boom, boom. Like, oh my God. And he's dressed in blue head to toe. And you, it took you like that long to realize he's wearing a University of Michigan jacket. He's celebrating the national championship. It had dates going down both sleeves of, of, their, of, their, of, their, of their season. I mean, he was just decked out. His hat, big Michigan hat going on. His, his sweatpants were blue. They matched the jacket. His shoes, his tennis shoes had the Michigan M on them to match the sweatpants, to match the jacket, the hat. He took the jacket off. He had a long sleeve t-shirt on with the entire schedule of what this year was on how they won. I didn't and check the boxers. I'm just assuming everything would just come, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like he was decked head to toe in Michigan, Michigan. You didn't have to ask, hey, who's his favorite team? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, whoop, there it is. I mean, he was, he was bussing. Y'all understand? Like I said, man, you got a reason to wear that jacket proud. He goes, I know we blew, we blew. I mean, he was, he was excited about it. And all I could do was celebrate him. He had a big smile on his face. He was full of joy there with his, it looked like his, his adult son and granddaughter. I mean, they, they were just, they were just wonderful, but there was no question who he loved. He wore it out loud. Can I tell you something? We're sitting there and I'm kind of looking at this guy and I'm getting back to Malachi and Talia and Talia and Malachi and Malachi. And, and, and I'm loving it. And I just kept looking and I thought, man, I want to live my faith like that. 
Not obnoxious because this guy wasn't. He, he was dressed head to toe and all this, but the biggest smile. You, 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 if you hated Michigan, you had to love him. He's like, dang, he's going to make me smile at him. Oh, no. Like, like oh, that's going. Like, I mean, he, he was just, he was, he was infectious. When he stepped on the plane, it commanded attention. Michigan is here. The entire state just walked into the plane right now because he was just this large and in charge guy. Like, man, I mean, he, he, he was that. I, I want my faith to be that. That before you hear me talk, there's a presence and an atmosphere that I carry with me. That when I step inside the office or if, if I'm on vacation, or if I'm shopping, if I'm at the bank, wherever I am, that there is a presence of hope, strength, joy, and there's zero question as to who I'm connected to and what I've invested in and who I'm wearing today from head to toe. You see, it would have really been bad if he was wearing a Michigan jacket and Ohio State pants. That would have been a mess. Like, who do you pull for, dude? Who, which one? And you see, I don't want what I wear in culture to give mixed signals where people wonder who it is that I'm pulling for and how I'm living my life. I want to be decked out head to toe. Jesus, I love him and I love you. Jesus, he's for me and I'm for you. Jesus, he helps me and I'll help you. We live our lives this way. We live it out loud so that who we are is repped. Before they even hear us, they know that we're all in. It's exactly what God's commands were to Israel. God was talking to Israel. He said, I need you to dress head to toe all in. I, I, I need you to leave zero question because here's what I know about humanity. Y'all are fickle. And when I say y'all, I mean me too. We're crazy. We're fickle. Like we love something one minute. We're like, eh, I don't know. The next like it, it, it can flip back and forth. And what God was saying is like, I know y'all because I made you. And I know how y'all are. And if you're not all in, you're leaving room for something else to step in. And you might try to slide a different pair of shoes on with that outfit and that, those shoes don't go with that outfit. And you'll start playing and dabbling in some stuff that don't go together. I need you to be all in. One color, one label. I need you to be one team. I need you to go hard. I need you to be bussing. I need you to lean into this thing and go hard. There's no room to act cute with this. There's no room to play with this. Well, I just don't want to beat. Oh, stop it. Jesus will never make you weird. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Jesus will never make you weird. No, he does not. No, he does not. He'll make you love people that you questioned. I don't even know, but I'm loving them. I'm praying for them. Amen. I, I, there's, he'll, he'll make you hold it together. He'll, 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 he'll work on you on the inside. Last night we were, we were trying to get on the elevator, and this guy cut us off, and we got all these bags, and we got kids and suitcases, and he cut us off and just ran on the elevator and took the whole thing up. And I'm like, yeah. In Jesus' name. And then I said something I shouldn't have said. I said, bless your heart. Because, you know, that's not a blessing. That was not a blessing. That, that's, that's a southern way of cussing people. And, and you shouldn't have done that. You'll bless you. But I got convicted for my attitude. My attitude was wrong. Oh, what he did was wrong. I should have tripped him. He, he, he was out of, no, no I, should, I should not have tripped him, but, but, I, but, but my attitude, like, man, it just rose up in me. Anybody ever had your attitude sneak up on you and just go there? If your neighbor's not raising your hand right now, look at him and say, liar, liar, pants on fire, because you know they have. You know they have. God was telling Israel, if you don't take me serious, if you don't go all in, if you don't lean hard, you're going to live weak. And you're going to be flopping and you're going to wonder, does this thing work? And the reason it doesn't work is you're wearing mixed labels and nobody knows who you are and where you fit in. you got to make sure it's loud and proud. I promise you, ain't nobody going to talk to that big mountain wearing everything Michigan and try to talk him into loving another team. It ain't happening. And we need to live our lives that way as well. That's what first fruit was about in the Bible. See, it's not, it's not a money thing. It was so much deeper than that. And that's why we're celebrating it for these next two weeks. In fact, Leviticus chapter 23, this is the book of the Bible that nobody reads. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. I, I want you to look at this, look at this verse, and, and you read the highlighted sections with me when I get there. But here, here's what God told Israel, told his people. When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. God said, I'm going to bring you into a promised land, 
But when I do, there's going to be an amazing, amazing stuff waiting on you when you get there. All kinds of crops and, and things there. When it happens, I want you to, in the very first harvest, the winter is over, the spring hits, everything is growing. Take the first, do not eat it. Bring it to me. Give it to me. Th this was... This was God's command, and it, see, it doesn't register with us in 24 as to, okay, what's the big deal? They are, they're, they're farmers. They're people who live off the land. If the land doesn't produce it, they don't eat. If the land doesn't produce it, their children don't eat. This is live or die based on what happens with the crops. And finally, a crop hits, and God goes, isn't that beautiful? Finally, it's here. Give it to me. They're like, in order for them to bring the first fruit to God, they were having to declare, this is the best and the first, and everything inside of me screams to eat it. Because if I give this to him, I'm still eating out of my reserves, and I have no promise that it's going to rain next week, rain the following month. I don't know if anything else is going to grow. All I have is what I know is here now. But if I give this to him, it's going to be completely up to him if I eat again tomorrow. It was a huge step of trust. I want to trust him. Because your emotions are going crazy. Faith happens in your spirit. Trust happens in your emotions, in your soul, in your mind. And that's what God was dealing with here. God said, I want you to bring it to me. And because literally, literally, they had reaped what they had sowed. Their work was now paying off. And now God says, bring me the payoff. In the first of every year, bring it to me. Why was God doing this? Here's what he wanted to say. Don't forget who the true source of your life really is. Some of y'all actually think that your job supplies your resources for you. <laughs> Some of y'all think you got peace in your heart because of how, th how good things are at the house. That is hilarious. You, 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 you think you're actually in control of 24. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. No. The truth is, every one of us have insecure situations all around us. And God is involved intricately in your life not blanket you he knows your dna he knows your real age not the one you tell everybody he knows your real he knows your weight he knows your weight oh my god he knows your weight. he knows the your real hair color he knows this stuff he knows this stuff about you and he's into you and he's working for you he's he's, he's making life work this is what he does don't forget who provides but here's what i want to show you there's two big promises hidden inside even just the word first fruit itself. And, and you have to go to the original language, the Hebrew, to see this. And so we're not going to take a Hebrew lesson. I'm just going to give you two things and get off this real quick. The first word that we have for the word first fruit in the Hebrew is bakurim. And bakurim literally translates as this, a promise to come. You don't have it right now but it's coming. When you get involved in first fruit, you are scheduling something in your future that would not have been there. It's on the way. Would you tell somebody, it's on the way, it's on the way, it's on the way. That's right. Y'all know what it's like when you order something from Amazon and you waiting on that thing and you waiting on that thing and you keep looking out the door, all the neighbors got it. Oh my God, why did I get And you, you just always check it. It, it, it. It's on the way, it's on the way. So number one, it's a promise to come. The second word used in the Bible for first fruit is really interesting. It's, the, the, it's pronounced yam rashit. Yam means day, and rashit is a word that means beginning or first. Yam rashit is a word that's used to describe first fruit. Both of these words are used there. And the fuller significance of this, the reason this is interesting is Rashit for first fruit is the same word, the very first word of your Bible. In the beginning, the same word for in the beginning is the same word for first fruit. It is the same word for Genesis. The book of Genesis is Bereshit. 
It's the same word. In other words, what is it that happens, that happened in the book of Genesis? How did we start? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God took nothing and made something. In the beginning, God took void and chaos and put order to it. In the beginning, there was no life, but God stepped into it, and he formed man out of nothing, and he breathed life into it. Here's what First Fruits is telling us from this definition. That thing, it's a brand new Genesis in your life. When you step into first fruit, number one, there is a promise to come. But number two, there is brand new life that you can't understand because it's a God thing how he gets involved and he starts to produce stuff that was never there before. He brings it alive and it's a Genesis for your life. Anybody like the idea of a brand new start in some things where like this thing hits and like, man, if he, whatever he did in Genesis, he can do in my life. If he brought something to life there that was never there before he can do it inside your marriage he can do it with your kids he can do it in your career he can bring something and put it there i don't even have a way of explaining the blessing in my life right now all i can say is it must be god i think i'm his favorite and i'm here to tell you right now you are his favorite and that's what he wants to do in your life a promise to come and a brand new start where things become brand new. This is the promise that you and I live with. First fruits in Genesis, the same word, the day of beginning or first. This, there's two, these two hidden keys, these two hidden insights in here are things that you and I are to embrace and live on. That man, something greater is coming and I'm living in a brand new day of my life. This is the good stuff of life and this is what God promised. You see, first fruit, when the people got involved, when you and I get involved, it demonstrates three things. Number one, obedience. I know we all hate that word. We want our kids to do it. We just don't want to do it anymore. But obedience. Israel, I want you to bring the first fruit. It's illogical, I know. But you're going to do it because you revere me as God. I am God. And they said, you are. We will obey. But number two, it was also remembering. I remember what God did last year. I remember what God did the year before. God has blessed my life. Can anybody just think of one or two things that God has done just to bless, help, increase your life? Has it, has it been good to you or has it been all mine? Because I'm telling you right now, I'm a leave, living, breathing, walking witness, a testimony that God is good and he favors. I, we can't, don't you forget, don't you forget where he brought you from. You ever given somebody a gift before and they forgot that you gave it to them? They wearing that thing, go, ooh, it looks good. Yeah, someone gave it to me. I don't know where. Well, I gave that thing to you. What do you mean? God loads us with gifts. Don't forget where your blessings come from. Number one, it was obedience. Number two, it was remembering. Number three, the third thing first fruit does is it's trust. It's my trust in action. There's no trust until there's a step. There's no trust until there's trepidation. Like, whoo, I'm out of control. Welcome to trust. You see, nothing grows without trust. Marriages, people can love each other and fall out of trust. And a marriage will crash because they don't trust anymore. They can love each other, but they don't trust each other anymore. So it's not, an, it's not enough to love. If for a relationship to grow, there must be trust. And so God, knowing this, knowing how he wired us, he goes, I'm going to pre-wire some things in your world where you're going to have to trust me. Why is that? God doesn't need anything from us, but he's trying to leverage a connection between our heart and his heart and keep the relationship growing so we're not wearing mixed teams in our outfit. We are all dressed in Team Jesus. That's what he's trying to do. So throughout the Bible, we see pictures of what first fruit looks like. The rabbis, uh, the rabbinic scholars and Jewish scholars, they write to tell us some of the stuff. Much of it is biblically identifiable, but, but all this history, it all comes and it brings to fashion and it shows us 
what happens on the day of first fruits. In fact, I'm going to show you six things. And if you have your brochure, you can actually open it. I, I'm going to speak from these six things in this brochure. It's why we made it for you. So you can take this and study it for yourself. What happened on the day of first fruit? Not all on the one day in history, but every, every year there's a first fruit day. And throughout time, it was always on first fruit. These six things happen. And so what was it that happened and what's the message behind it that when you and I say yes to first fruit, this is coming to your house. Anybody ready to see some blessing on the way to your house that you can't get any other way? Check out what God showed us. The first message of first fruit, Noah's ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. I know, not sexy, you saw the movie. I get it, it's all fine. But let me help you with something. Storms, the storms came to an end. All the flood that surrounded the world, it finally began to recede. Let me help you with something. Crazy, they were in that ark 370 days. Locked up with their family. And it wasn't no Disney cruise, do you understand? Locked up with the 370 days, no excursion, you know, we're, we're getting off in Greece. You ain't getting off nowhere. You riding this boat 370 days and the water begins to find on the day of first fruit. Boom. They finally felt the ark rest and it rested on Mount Ararat. Why Mount Ararat? I'm glad you asked. Because the, the word Ararat, it literally means the curse is reversed. God said, I'm going to begin to pull circumstances. I'm draining the circumstances out of your life. And I'm going to bring peace to the chaos. And I'm going to let you rest in a place where the curse that you've been dealing with in your family, in those cycles in your family, it's got, it's got to stop. I'm going to bring it to rest. I'm reversing the curse on the day of first fruit. It's going to happen in your life. I like that promise. Do you realize that when God flooded the earth, do you know what he actually did? He baptized the earth. Like he submerged everything. The earth was wicked. The people were wicked. Their minds, they kissed their brains goodbye. It's like Ybor City on a Friday and Saturday night. It's like crazy out there, right? And God says, I'm going to just wash the whole world. And not only did he, he, he baptized the world. Just like when someone gets baptized out there, they gave their life to Jesus. When they're baptized, it's like we put them under the water like they are dying to the old. And then they're pulled back up, resurrected to the new. That's what baptism is. That's what happened to the earth. God washed the whole earth with the flood and it appeared brand new again. And that, that baptized new beginning happens also in example number two. Israel walked walked through the Red Sea on the day of first fruits. They were, in, they were in Egypt, 430 years of bondage. God talks to Big Mo. He sends Mo to Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. Oh, saw the movie, right? Good movie. And, so, and, God, and, Mo, and Pharaoh goes, no, no, no. And so God sends 10 plagues in. All of a sudden, Pharaoh goes, get out, get out, get out. And so all of a sudden, now they got to run because the plagues were so bad. And so on Passover, the lamb's blood was put on the doorpost. The death angel walked by. That was on Passover. Three days later is when you get to the festival, the celebration of first fruit. It was three days later. They got to the Red Sea. They're running. Pharaoh's now coming behind them. Here comes all the armies, the church, to take them back into bondage. And now they're going, oh, shucks. We don't have no boat. We ain't floating off on this stick. Like, well, how do we get across this? And, 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 and the, the rabbis tell us that it was when the Levites, the priests, started stepping into the water that once the water got up to their neck, then the circumstances, the water split and made a dry ground for everybody to walk through. Sometimes you got to walk into the circumstances before they get out of the way. And then you find out the God in you is greater than the circumstances outside of you. And the circumstances have to move, not because we're great, but because he's great. So I keep praying and I keep stepping. And I keep praying and I keep dealing with this marriage. And I keep praying and I keep dealing with these kids. And I keep praying and I keep going to that job. I keep praying and I keep trusting. And as you do, God starts opening things up. And what happened? All of Israel walks through. They've got water stacked on both sides. They're walking through going, dang. <laughs> Bussing. Okay, I mean, could you, could you imagine? No, you can't imagine. Let me help you. Do you know what God did? Not only did he baptize the world with the flood, he baptized the entire nation of Israel because he immersed them under the water. They didn't get wet, but he took them under the water 
and brought them out the other side on the day of first fruits. I wonder what the message is telling us. Well, it gets gooder. Because the third thing, there's only 92, so hold on. We're, we're just going to knock it. No, I'm kidding. kidding. They're just six. They entered the promised land on the day of first fruit. You can't appreciate that until you remember where they were before they got to the promised land. They're hanging out in a wilderness, a desert for 40 years because a bunch of people went crazy. God said, fine, it should have been an 11-day journey. 40 years later, I hope you're not on that merry-go-round. 40 years later, now they're stepping in, and when they come into the promised land, there was already fruit hanging on the trees. There was already crops growing in the ground. Like, it's all there. They walked into a ready-made blessing. Like, darn. Like, all of a sudden, the dry times are over. The arid, the, the, the moving here and there. I'm bringing you home. I'm bringing you to a place of rest. I'm bringing you to a place of peace. No more attacks from around you. I'm going to have provision all around you. In fact, he says it's a land flowing with milk and honey and Reese's. And it's all in right there together. It's, God said, I'm blessing you, but when I do this, he said in Deuteronomy 26, when I bring you into this place, I want you to honor me with the first that you take in that land. The first apples you pull off that tree, I want you to offer them to me. The first grain out of that field, I want you to honor me with it. I'm the one that provided it all. You bring me the first, and if you bring me the first, there'll be a promise to come, and it will be a brand new genesis, a brand new start in your life from this day forward. It all happened on the day of first fruit. And then there was this guy named King Hezekiah. He had a jacked up daddy named King Ahaz. King Ahaz was over the tribe of Judah and he was a mess. He was into idol worship. He was, he was wearing all kinds of colors. He had like five different teams represented in his outfit. He was a mess. And he was worshiping this, worshiping that. A horrible king. The nation of uh, the, 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 uh, Judah had gone into idol worship. And even the, even, even the temple that they worshiped in that was supposed to be used to worship God, it was just an absolute mess. And King Hezekiah comes in. His daddy Ahaz died at 36 years old. He was a mess. King Ahaz, young King, uh, young King uh, Hezekiah, he steps up and he goes and he cleanses the temple. He says, it's been defiled long enough. Clean it out. This is a place where we worship God. He's holy. He deserves the best. He got rid of all the idols and he brought worship back to the, 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 uh, the nation of Judah. Watch this. And there was a major spiritual awakening that hit the people. Ladies and gentlemen, would it be all right? If you had a spiritual awakening in 2024 that you, you have never experienced in your entire life, I'm talking about where your heart is so sensitized to the presence of God that he can get your attention, not your mama's attention, not your grandmom's attention, your attention. Like all of a sudden, I feel like he loves me. I feel like he knows me. I, I've never experienced this. I've done church, but I've never known this before. I want you to know he's real and he loves you and he wants to show himself in your life. And like Hezekiah did, on the day of first fruit, when he cleansed the temple, a brand new spiritual awakening hit his life. Ladies and gentlemen, first fruit brings an awareness, a God consciousness to our life that I'm focusing on him. I want him to be my first. I want him to be my last. I want him to lead my day. I'm dressing from head to toe in who he is. I'm going to know him. I'm going to rep him. It's all about him leading my life. That's what Hezekiah was declaring to us. I'm breaking family cycles. I'm honoring God with my life. I'm not going to be here 20, uh, next year this time. Something different's happening. I'm going to learn to pray. I'm going to discover my Bible. I'm going to read this. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to know it. Yes, you can learn it. Yes, you can know it. There's no superstars in this. We're all progressing one step at a time. We need each other, but you can do this. The fifth thing that happened, Queen Esther defeated Haman. That's a great story. Haman, a modern, modern day Scrooge, went to the king and said, all the Hebrew people need to die. Sign this order and we'll get it all going. And the king signed the order. Haman took it. He runs out. He starts building gallows to hang every Hebrew person on the gallows. Esther, who was a Jewish girl, she was chosen by the king to be the queen. And she steps up. If she approached the king on her own, she could lose her life because you don't do that. You're always summoned by the king. 
But she said, I was made for such a time as this. And if I perish, I perish. And she walked in to see the king. She was probably smelling good and wearing something really nice looking. But she walked in to see the king. He's the head, but she's the neck. He walked in to see the king. She shared her heart with the king. The king reversed the edict that had been sent out. And the man that built the gallows, Haman, the next day after a three-day fast that Esther called for all of the Hebrew people to pray over, on the third day, which came out to first fruit, Haman was hung on his own gallows. God reversed the curse. You see, here's, here's what you got to know. Weapons will be formed. There will be some things that will be prepared to destroy you, your family, news on the job, things in the family. It looks bad. It looks bad financially. It looks bad physically. The doctors are saying this. I get that. But we serve a God who can see that, and he can still take it and make it spin and turn it for your good. you got to keep trusting. It happens because of a first fruit trust, a first fruit reach. I'm doing this to connect with him. I'm done with this. This is the most important one of all. What's the sixth thing that we have that happened on first fruit? Jesus rose from the dead on first fruits. The day of first fruits. I love this. They killed him on Passover. They put him in the ground. Three days later, he gets up. And he says, there's resurrection power left in that grave. Because all my followers who come after me, when your situations hit a grave, dead situation, I want you to look around because there is enough resurrection power I left behind to bring the dreams back, to bring the joy back, to bring the peace back. It might look bad, but it's not over yet. I am your first fruit. I can turn this situation around in your life. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. You read the highlighted parts. Ready? One, two, three. Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by man, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Here's what the Bible is saying. Because Jesus died, went to the grave and came back, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. For all of those who know Jesus, you and I, the Bible says in Hebrews, we have an appointment once to die. We will, not, we will leave this earth by the grave. But when we are there, the Bible says when Jesus returns for all of us, that just like he got up, you and I will get up. He was the first fruit. We are going to be just like him. We come back. Let me ask you something. Anybody got a family member that you know is going to be getting up on that day? Anybody got a loved one, a friend that you said goodbye to, but there's about to be a resurrection? There is a day coming that's going to be in the end of time but that also is in our life today and it all happens on the day of first fruit so here's what I'm telling you God will end storms for you like he did Noah on first fruit God will get you through the impossible like he did with Moses on in the Red Sea on the day of first fruit you will taste the promises of God like Israel did on the day of first fruit in the promised land God will restore and renew your life like Hezekiah in the temple on the day of first fruit God God will stop the enemy's plan like he did for Queen Esther on the day of first fruit. God will give you new life in and through the life of Jesus like he did on the day of first fruit. First fruit, ladies and gentlemen, is not to be played with. It is that thing that you hold on to and says, yes, your will, not my will. Let's go. I'll obey you. I'll remember that you're good in everything you do. And I'll trust you going forward with the promise to come and a brand new day in my life. Would you stand to your feet all through this place? I want to pray over you right now. I want to pray over you right now where you stand because some of you are in a bad situation and you're hurting. And I want to ask God to touch and strengthen your life. And I'm going to show you a video that's going to awaken you to the reality of what first fruits look like. Before we go there, though, I want to pray over your heart. I want to pray over your family. I want to pray over your relationships. Heavenly Father, today in this room and those watching online, there are people that need you like never before. They need your presence. They need your power. They need you to show up and do things that no man could do. 
without you, this thing doesn't work. But God, today we decree that we're getting off, we're taking off the mixed colors. We're getting back to that one outfit, head to toe. And it's Jesus. We're coming after you in 24. We are bussing with you in 24. I'll make no apologies for it. I'm all in. Back and forth doesn't work. Here and there, a little here. No, I've got to go all in. I'm going to lose my mind if I don't buy into who you are and say yes to your plan. I'm not perfect. I've got issues. I'm wrinkled. I've got stains, but I'm trusting you that one day at a time your blessings will flow. I pray over my friends in this room. I pray over marriages. I pray over students. I pray over the married. I pray over the singles. I pray over students that God today you would just lift, encourage, wrap arms around, let people feel your love, your presence, and know that you're for us. You're a God that gives. And if you're ever asking something from us, it's because you've got blessing on your mind on the other side. Encourage the hearts of my friends today as we take steps in you. We decree that the best is yet to come in Jesus name everybody said amen Amen. if you receive that today put those hands together we hope this message encouraged you and to hear more encouraging messages check us out at our website at freelifechapel.org until then we hope to see you next time